conversation. Hi, everyone. We'll just wait for a minute or two, letting attendees join in and then get started. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Be Waste Wise. Uh, I am Shweta Vanapani. I'm the community builder of Be Waste Wise. We currently organized two webinars every month on uh, a variety of diverse topics uh, related to waste globally. And uh, in case you haven't seen our webinars before, please head to our website. We have a webinar section where you will have all of it. And uh, just a reminder, we have a new revamped website, making it far easier for you to access all our past webinars. So if you have not watched any of Adam's many webinars on Waste Wise, you can go to his profile and you can find all of them there. Uh, in today's uh, webinar, we're going to be discussing green skills. We have Adam Reed, Chief Sustainability and External Affairs Officer of Suez UK, who is moderating the webinar. Adam is going to talk to Andy Rees, Head of Waste Strategy at the Welsh Government, Katie Cockburn, Professional Services Director at CIWM, and Stephen Barrett, Director of Membership and Strategic Engagement, Energy and Utility Skills. Uh, just a general reminder, we will take your questions. We already have received a few of your questions, which have been passed on to the panel. Please use the Q&A section for your questions. Uh, use chat to introduce yourselves, add any comments. And in case there is any topic you would like us to cover in the future, either with Adam or with any other moderator, please write to us at connect at wastewise.be. Over to you, Adam. Oh, thank you, Sweater, for a, a full introduction. That's great. Uh, there are other chair people available um, on the Be Waste Wise website, so you could check out their webinars as well, but they're not quite as good as mine. Um, excellent panel today. Looking forward to talking to them. They're all very close to the uh, the green skills and the transition of the waste and resources and associated sectors as we transition to net zero and circular economy. And I've got to be honest, although it's a, a UK centric panel today, I think much of this will be of international interest. And I've got to be honest, the um, the transitions in other geographies and other domains will be similar. Um, and I think that's what's going to be quite interesting today is what lessons can we learn and what shortcuts can we take and what problems must we avoid um, as we look to do similar transitions globally. Um, Green skills are very close to my heart. I've done a couple of Be Waste Wise webinars on green skills over the last what, three or four years now. Um, and, and for my sins, I sit on the uh, English government, just so I don't annoy Andy, English government um, green jobs delivery group, which is a, a representative group uh, of 12 different sectors in, well, it's in the UK, but, but essentially in England, who are all looking to go through rapid decarbonisation progress towards net zero and, and to embed more circular solutions. And all of them have been mapping the types of skills, the, the, the number of individuals, the, the types of role, the key competencies that we're going to need at different times in that transition. So today's webinar is a little bit of a reflection on that because we got to that point, I think, where we're starting to seriously look at our sector and others and go, have we got some critical points? Is there going to be some tensions um, can we get that many green chemists in the next five years? I use that as an exemplar rather than, you know, a, a fact and, and, and hence bringing together a great panel. So hopefully you, the audience are going to get your questions answered. Great. I can see some chat going already. Thank you for that. Um, don't hesitate in taking us in whatever direction you'd like to take us. Uh, my job will just be to facilitate the, uh, the order of the questions and, and keep some of these panelists the time, because I know how much they like to talk about green skills and net zero. Um, so first up, I'm going to go policy, I think. is that, I'm going to go Andy. I want to, just as a government official working in a in a rapidly transitioning Welsh uh, sector, economy, geography, nation, um, just set out how you see both the transition to low carbon resource efficiency type stuff, but also where are those critical skills issues from your perspective, Andy. Yeah, okay. Uh, thanks, Adam. Uh, Buridar, good morning. Uh, Prinhan, Dar, good afternoon. So those uh, in different parts of the, of the world, uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to speak. Um, Wales is a, a small nation with a big ambition. So to put it into context, we've set various targets for 2050, uh, including zero waste, um, one planet resource use, I'm not aware of many nations that have set that, that target, and of course, net zero by 2050. Um, and we're focusing on uh, really some of the really important sectors like industry, manufacturing, 
public sector and of course the waste sector in defining our pathways for net zero. Um, we've always been keen to support education and skills right since our first waste strategy in 2002, um, covering resource efficiency, waste uh, and a circular economy. So it's a really important key part of the jigsaw. And uh, as with any jigsaw, it's never complete unless you put all of the pieces uh, in place. We published in 2021 our circular economy strategy uh, beyond recycling. Um, and just I'll just read some of the sort of actions uh, on that, but I'll be quick, uh, Adam, don't worry. So we want to invest in green skills such as eco design, reuse, repair, re-engineering, et cetera, uh, to support the development of the workforce. We want to seek to address any gaps in a circular economy training skills, development and qualifications. Uh, we want to align apprenticeships with the needs of the Welsh economy um, and make sure that they're sort of uh, circular economy and resource efficiency embedded in them. Uh, we want to invest in training and skills necessary for all the things I've mentioned, um, particularly within the sector, but then much wider. We want green skills across all of the workforces uh, to make sure everyone plays their part. Um, also, we want to provide support for educational and skills development um, at all levels, including schools, training, qualifications, and apprenticeships. And then finally, we need children and young people to play a prominent role in driving our circular economy. So there's an example of some of the things we've covered in our strategy. And then finally, a quick plug for our net zero sector skills consultation that was published the other day. Uh, responses back by the 31st of December. It has a very strong section on waste and circular economy, not just because I played a major part in writing it, but we used um, CIWM's uh, Beyond Waste Essential Skills for a Greener Tomorrow. So thank you very much, CIWM, you know, for all the efforts that you've done there. Um, we've identified within that all of the vast range of skills that we're looking for in relation to circular economy and resource efficiency, not just about waste. Make that point. Thank, thank, thank you, you, Andy. That's a, that's a perfect segue in, in, into Katie, but I'm going to I'm going to ask you a question first because it's my prerogative, and, and and I guess you know you've got a lot of these areas under your remit and your colleagues' remit. It, it, it makes life a little bit easier to join some of your political dots with your economic dots and your employment dots. So um, so we'll we'll set that in context. But I mean. You know, a country like Wales, it's kind of it, it's had its own economic transitions over the years. I mean, people might, you know, it's a mining um, yeah. economy and, and service economy now, lots of tourism. Um, I, I, how, how does circular businesses fit in there? Where What's the kind of sectors that you think are going to grow? Where, where, give me some examples yeah. of the, the industries that you think... Okay. Have yeah. roles and okay. opportunities. Well, um, you know, we, we were actually a leader in the world in terms of the industrial revolution, large, largely because of our coal and iron deposits. So we, we also led one time in uh, re refining copper, zinc um, and lead. I think we were actually, Swansea actually was the world centre uh, for that. Um, so there is still a legacy of that sort of heavy engineering and uh, min mineral and metal use. So not surprisingly, somebody like the Royal Mint, for example, who no longer, which is based in Wales, uh, probably hasn't got much of a future manufacturing coins um, and banknotes in the future. So they're now diversifying and they are um, going to process uh, waste electrical and electronic equipment to recover precious metals and actually make uh, gold coins, uh, maybe, but also uh, gold jewellery and other items. And they see that as a key diversification for them, utilising some of the skills that they already have and that they can find in other parts of Wales. Also things like um, decommissioning of major infrastructure um, and also uh, maintenance and repair. So for example, we've got companies who repair some of the very large jet engines on uh, airplanes, for example. So they keep them going. So things like maintenance are really crucial because um, keep keep uh, items in productive use for as long as possible, key parts of the circular economy and repair them as necessary. So those heavy engineering skills that we already have can be reapplied towards a circular economy and, and some of them are already doing circular economy stuff so excellent thank you so great examples and and i really like the fact that they're live now and we can learn from that so that's great katie CIWM, CIWM have already been mentioned i'll let you introduce CIWM in a moment and you've been very much at the heart of everything that they've been churning out in in this space over recent years so give us a little bit of a, an insight to where where is CIWM and the, the green skills agenda 
Thanks, Adam. Um, yeah, so for, for those who don't know, the CRWM, the Chartered Institution of Waste Management, is the uh, leading professional body uh, in the world, actually, for um, waste and resource professionals. Um, and as part of that, we take seriously our responsibility to ensure that we have uh, professional standards in our sector and that we that we promote a, a, a sector that is a fantastic place to work. Um, so in terms of preparing for this circular net zero transition, um, we've been trying to answer some questions really. So the first question for us is, you know, what are the type of jobs that are gonna be needed? What are the skill sets that are gonna to need to support them? And what is the scale of that? Um, and so as Andy very nicely already plugged, um, we, we published some research back in March um, of this year, uh, which is available on our website, um, openly available. And it, it really sets out uh, some of those answers for us. But of course, that's only the first step. So um, in Green Careers Week from November 6th, uh, we're launching a skills matrix, um, or a competence framework, which really sets out um, at every level of our sector what uh, skills and competencies are needed in order to be successful, right from our frontline workers to those people who are, um, you know, inventing new business models, um, right to those thought, those thought leaders. So that's that's the first question. What do we need? How much do we need? Second question we have been answering has been, um, you know, how do we ensure that we have the skills provision in time um, and available for the people who are going to need it to upskill um, and reskill? Um, so we've been looking at uh, how our current qualification uh, system aligns to that skills matrix that I spoke about. Um, we've been to, we've been looking at whether or not we need to build in new qualifications, new apprenticeship programs, new new training programs, working directly with employers. Um, in some cases to build very bespoke specific programs um, and actually ha have we got the trainers to deliver those so part of that work has also been about ensuring that um, the network of providers that we've got here in the UK are set up to deliver those those skills programs um, really exciting because we've got a new level two in reuse and refurbishment which is obviously very aligned to circular economy um, which of course is is going to um, support people to to ensure that they've got those uh, basic reuse and repair skills, very practical qualification um, launching in the next couple of months. So new, new developments, have we got the skills? Second question. Third question we've been answering um, is how do we secure investment and support from government and from industry? And that's where with Adam sitting on the, uh, with you sitting on the, the Green Jobs Delivery Group, we've been um, talking to government and talking to industry about how we fund and support the development of these, of these skills. Um, and then that fourth question, where are the people coming from? We've, we've got to fill we've got if we you know we've got to fill those jobs we've got to, we've got to get those people on on those training programs so um we've been doing some work on careers as well and ensuring that we have a narrative that really inspires people to join a sector that is right at the front line of the climate crisis and um that's been a, a big part of what we've been working on recently um when we did our research we we found that only one of the four nations mentioned circular economy in their careers guidance that's not okay um and that's something that we want to fix so we've been working with partners on our skills for the future working group partners like IEMA partners like department for education and department for work and pensions to ensure that we put out and develop um, really engaging careers content that can inspire the next generation of people to do what we all do and support and protect the planet thank you I thought you were going to plug Andy then for being it, it, well, uh, yeah, I should say actually that the one of the four nations was, of course, Wales. No leading, surprises. Le no leading, surprises there. leading the way again, Andy. So well done, you. Um, thanks, Katie. I mean, like you and I spend a lot of time working together, so you know this conversation could could go in any direction. But um, I'm I, I'm conscious. Give me a flavour of the five or six key types of job that you think are going to be boom opportunity over the next five to ten years. The, the ones that are going to really enable this kind of key transformation to happen because you know there's lots of jobs and the reports you know quote something like you know 400 and 500 thousand you know new jobs over the next sort of 20 years I mean it's huge numbers which should be really exciting for people that are on this call but I'm interested in the ones that if we don't get them in the short term we could undermine the transition more more uh, more generally yeah good question <laughs> um 
uh, absolutely. We so we were expecting the first sort of uh, five to ten years of the transition to be all about. Um, reacting to policy change. And so we absolutely expect to see um, more regulators and more people who can help the sector respond to that policy change. So um, people who are policy specialists are going to be really important to that transition, particularly in the first sort of five to 10 years. Um, reuse and repair specialists, hence the qualification. Um, we, we think that it's, uh, it's really important that we commercialise and industrialise um, reuse and repair. We think there's a massive opportunity for UK PLC there. And um, we know that there are um, people who are perhaps not currently in the workforce, perhaps have been in the workforce and retired who could come back and do some really good work in, in that sector. So reuse and repair is important. Um, Material scientists, chemists, you mentioned green chemists earlier. Um, as things get more complex, we know we're going to have to understand more, more and more complex materials and how we how we manage those. So that's going to be really important going forward. Um, and then I think sort of like moving slightly outside of the sector, we've got, or not really outside of the sector, but moving into those other sectors and recognising where we're embedded within others, we've got, um, you know, people who are actually doing the designing of products and of packaging. And, you know, we have a role in ensuring that we are educating and um, really supporting the behaviour change of those other sectors as well. So behaviour change specialists, critically important. Very good. Andy? Does that resonate with the kind of thinking that's been been done in Wales today? Are they the kinds of role that that you're thinking? Yeah, we need a load of those as well. Or have you got some more specific, you know, some Welsh exemplars or that that, that might need to come to the fore? Um, yeah, I mean, de de definitely. Um, I mean, we, you know, we 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 do a lot with repair. Cafe Wales, um, uh, Benthig Library of Sin, things, etc., and a lot with the community and third sector over the years. Yep. Um, but CRWM is right that there also needs to be the sort of, you know, the, the I don't want to use the word professional, but, you know, the, the sort of business side of it as well. Um, you know, Repair Cafe Wales, Benthig are, are very professional, but, but, it, but this has got to be mainstreamed as a business opportunity as well. Um, and perhaps not just the preserve of, of the third sector. Important though that is, because that brings in all sorts of uh, you know other imp important issues, particularly in terms of actually I don't know if something's been mentioned about diversity and inclusion yet. Um, but making sure we get the right workforce and provide those opportunities for everybody, and certainly the third sector has been very good at that over the years. Right, right from the last you know 25 years that I've been working in waste, they've been really exemplary at that sort of diversity and inclusion. So we need that as well. And I know CIWM, of course, are also uh, promoting that side of things as well. So they are. Thanks. For, and, and, and I think, you, you know, you make a really valid point. I mean, nobody wants the the third sector or the NGOs to, you know, to be muscled out as, as we transition to circularity. I mean, we we partner, Suez, my yeah, day job, absolutely. part partner with them on our, our Renew Hub in Manchester, where we recognise that their skills are, are, yeah. are their skills. And we, 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 we couldn't profess to be you know, experts in, in upholstery and, and carpentry. That's not what we do, but we can facilitate them yeah. doing what they're good at. And then you can get, you know, the apprenticeships and you can build the, um, the community benefits. So I think, you know, there's room for all sorts of different partnerships as we try to deliver, you know, the, the, the agenda to, to meet Katie's, Katie's point. Right. I'm conscious Stephen sat there very quietly. He's been he's been thinking long and hard about his opening statement, no doubt. But but Stephen, you're you're working in a space that's not quite as wide as Andy's, maybe, but but wider than Katie's in terms of the sectors you cover. So do you want to tell us a little bit about you know your organisation and and just how similar are, are some of the discussions around you know utilities and uh, 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 and, and the energy sector to to more waste and resources and 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 are, and are we going to be competing in the future perhaps for for future green skilled individuals? Well, I think you've hit the nail on the head there, Adam. I'll stop speaking now. Um, <laughs> I think there will be uh, competing a uh, competition for uh, for some of those roles. But look, I'll kind of open up and get into my uh, kind of 
quick five minute spiel so you can kind of uh, pick the bones from that we can uh, talk through it so i think the uh, the discussion i'm going to take it a little bit wider because we're covering things like water power gas and waste management so therefore i think in terms of the scope of the work which we've been looking at recently with regards to jobs um but not only jobs competence as well so looking at um, specific competencies which are required to carry out certain roles um we're finding that there is a um a lot of movement of individuals between various industries so therefore in terms of looking at job profiles perhaps um i think it's perhaps kind of closed uh closed in the the kind of left and right of arc ever so slightly there so what we need to do is make sure we're thinking about competencies but i think we've talked a lot about the net zero and it's worth reflecting that um some of the elements i suppose which we should be considering as part of this route to net zero being predicated on probably three maybe more arguably factors but um and i think i i mentioned this because um, we talk quite a lot about that um that net zero transition well a lot of that's being driven by that policy side so therefore we know that we need to transition to net zero because we've we've laid out in policy it's the right thing to do um but also there's other things to consider so economic viability um with industry and investors making sure they get a return on that investment so that can either slow it down or speed it up if we've got government backing then through creation of policy certainty i guess um and the right incentivization of market conditions i think that can also help and also customer willingness um, to adopt that new technology which will be influenced by factors such as cost of adopting perhaps new technology um, and also the lifetime costs as well um, myself i'm in norfolk although being welsh uh, myself um, i'm stuck in norfolk and i'm off grid um, and i have an oil tank um, in the garden so therefore if i transition to a ground source air source heat pump etc then there's going to be additional costs of setup of that but also there's going to be lifetime costs so therefore um all those sorts of factors they all kind of come into play on this so um so I suppose my key takeaway from that is we need to have long term planning. We need to uh, make sure we've got policy certainty and make sure we've got the right skills and making sure that they're sustainable at the right time. Um, we've seen certainly on the smart meter implementation program that we've trained all these smart meter installers over here. But actually, as we progress through that um, implementation plan here in the UK, we're getting to a point whereby they're going to start dying off. The demand for those is going to start dying off, um, although we're not seeing it at the moment. And there's still a strong push um, for the next couple or three years. Um, but actually, what do we do with those people afterwards? Moving them into things like um, installing EV charge points, et cetera, would be a sensible approach. But obviously, they need to go through that transition, then that competence um, upgrading, if you like. So making sure that we're taking a structured approach to uh, to taking that forward. So much of our work that we've been doing, um, it's already been mentioned, the Westminster uh, Green Jobs Delivery Group. Um, and we've been pretty central to the power networks side of things. So we've been pushing that forward. And that's been really based on the um, British Energy and Security Strategy. And the scope of that work has been much the same as has already been talked about, looking to identify what those future skills requirements are. Um, that work is now complete. So therefore, we've done heat maps on both power, gas, um, and water. In fact, the waste um, uh, management uh, uh, matrix is looking to be done later on this year. And interestingly, um, as we move on from that bit, we're looking at then routes to competence, which that piece of work is in progress. And we're seeing um, some green shoots, if you like, um, identifying issues in certain occupations where there are limited routes to competence outside of apprenticeships. So we've got the standard stuff, we've got apprenticeship programs, some gaps in qualification provision. We've already talked about uh, training provision um, and, and no T levels. So we've got a new system here in the UK, which is um, probably sits alongside the likes of A levels, et cetera, but there are no T levels in some of these more technical roles. And, um, and interestingly, they were never intended to be um, specific to industries, et cetera. But if you look at what you would want as an employer in industry, what you would want someone coming out of an academic system with, then perhaps it is some technical knowledge about the work that they're going into and not just that classic kind of engineering or maybe um, some more t some more of the um, um, traditional areas of, um, of, of education. Um, so finally, the last part that we go into then is assessing the current training um, infrastructure to deliver those future needs. And we're looking to do that up, up to the end of April 2024. But there's already quite a lot of work going on in that area because we have a training infrastructure ourselves with energy and utility skills. And that does deliver training quality assured right the way across um, across industry. But I think that's only half 
um, the puzzle. That's only uh, uh, half of the uh, the mix there. Uh, we do need to look at the education system as well. So as uh, FE colleges, et cetera, associated with apprenticeship programs and making sure that they've really not only got the um, the skills, um, but also they've got longevity. They, they you know, we, we're seeing a lot of um, that training infrastructure, the the people that were in training are retiring, et cetera, but also the cost of sometimes setting up um uh, training programs etc you know we, we we see on ground excavations for instance that the cost of having diggers sat around in between courses etc well that's uh, that's colossal and fe colleges simply don't have that infrastructure so therefore we do depend quite a lot on that um on that training infrastructure which is um, perhaps supported more by industry looking for those quick um, quick fire programs to pull through so alongside this work then on the power side we're working with um, solar nuclear hydrogen ccus carbon capture utilization and storage um, and water recognizing that is that there is a significant overlap in skills so when we looked at the heat maps which came out of power water and gas we we recognized straight away that there were certain skills which were coming to the fore and there was cross uh, crossover between all of those um, so therefore when we and you open this up by saying, well, you know, will there be some crossover? Are we competing with other industries? Absolutely, we are. And that's only within the ones that we've looked at. And certainly um, for things like major infrastructure projects, which are going on in the UK at the moment and uh, within the infrastructure uh, planning, there are other major projects which will all be competing for um, the same resource. So therefore, how do you position your industry and make it look, um, uh, you know, as a, as a, as a viable option for, um, the next young generation, which is coming out of school or perhaps university, well, we need to be thinking about how do we position industry as the industry for a greener world. Um, certainly waste, um, recycling, and certainly we've seen energy from waste, and I'll talk about that in a second, is going to be absolutely fundamental to us achieving that net zero. So therefore, we need to make sure that we can track those people in by saying, if you want to be part of the solution, then you've got to come and work with us. Um, so I mentioned uh, hydrogen earlier. We're working alongside um, the likes of Ofgem, um, where we had a project funded recently to look at the hydrogen skills requirements through gas um, utilization. Um, but also we are the standard setting body for um, that gas, use, gas utilization program. So therefore we worked um, alongside Desnes so the Department of Energy Security and Net Zero in Westminster again, and looking at what the skills and competency requirements are. So therefore, in terms of the engineer that comes into your home and the gas networks, um, we've been all over the skills requirements on that. There's been some interesting findings coming out of that work as we coordinate effort right the way across industry. We've also recently set up the National Skills Academy for gas to maintain a focus on current and future operations in gas. That's a really big, um, a, a bold movement, a strong move forward there because um, I'm not sure if any of you would have seen it, but the uh, Infrastructure Commission have just published a report um, which actually articulates that hydrogen probably won't be part of the solution um, for heating homes. Um, now, obviously, that's only a recommendation and government haven't really nailed their colours to the mast on that one yet. But um, we're hoping that it does become part of the uh, solution for heating homes because we think that there is a, um, a requirement for a really good energy mix and one solution doesn't fit all. So therefore, that's going to be a key component going forward. Okay. Particular interest to this group then perhaps is the CCUS. So um, and that program of work, which is being delivered again along, alongside the Green Jobs Delivery Group, is looking very much at the utilization, um, storage, transportation of that carbon, but they're not actually looking at the carbon capture element. So through our National Skills Academy for Power Generation Group, we're implementing a task and finish group to identify the roles um, the competencies and the route to competence to assess that um, what those requirements are and really put in place um, a sufficient infrastructure to be able to support that. So I suppose if there are any um, uh, any uh, people here which are interested or involved in that um, energy from waste space or plan to be in the future, then please do um, drop me a note and I shall pick up with you afterwards because I think uh, that coordination across industry is going to be really important as we address that need. Um, so finally, then, um, as part of our work with government, we're pulling together a cross-sector workshop on social impact. Um, and we're looking at the EDI piece, the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion and Social Mobility. Um, we've got input from power networks and water industry, and we'll be seeking input from other working groups ahead of a workshop in November. So therefore, that whole EDI element 
that um, that we're looking at. We need to be making sure that when we're looking at our sector attraction strategy, for instance, um, that we are considering all of these elements and looking at it from, through an um, EDI lens. Um, I think absolutely we need to be tapping into resources which are perhaps or have not traditionally looked at our industry as a potential career of choice. We need to be turning the tables on that. We need to be saying, absolutely, this is the place to be working if you want to be part of that solution. So I suppose just to conclude that there are multiple touch points across many industries with similar skills needs, um, appreciating that need to recognize competence rather than just job roles, I think will provide us with an opportunity for people to move around within the industry and thus enable greater retention of skilled resources at a time when there is going to be huge demand as we try to all at the same time achieve net zero. So I'm just going to pause there, Adam, and uh, hopefully you can pick the bones out of that and ask me a few questions on it. Thanks, Steve. I mean, it was loads in there. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, people are all going, oh, need to, need to contact Stephen about. So loads in there for you. That's good. I mean, I think the, the competition piece is really interesting. And I, I'm just going to, you know, flip back to, to, to Katie for a second. You know, look, you know, you, you are competing bodies with competing industries to some degree. Yet we've all got an in massive demand. This is just the UK, a mm -hmm. massive demand for, for new entrants. Um, who are going to come in, you know, hopefully running, not walking, you know, ready to go because this transition needs to happen. I mean, how do we collaborate mm. with these other sectors rather than, you know, go to war? Because if we all go to war, I think Andy's going to going to lose out when it comes to getting the resources he needs. I mean, I think I don't think war's an option. I think we're not going to achieve this on our own. I think the scale of the challenge is such that there is room for everybody. Uh, I think what we really need to do is understand where each of our strengths are and how we can best use those to ensure that the work that we're doing is the most successful that it can be to ensure that we've got the right people at the right time in the right place. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. And I, I, certainly when I, when I talk to your colleagues, Stephen, you know, we often talk about the narrative around our, our sectors, you know, our sectors are dirty, they're end of pipe, they're, you know, they're problematic, they're polluting, blah, 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 blah. this goes on, they're, they're necessary evils. Is, I get that one all the time. And yet in reality, we're, we, we could be at the heart of this, this transition, <laughs> all of us, you know, whether it's the water yeah. sector, the power yeah. sector, carbon capture, what, you know, waste and resources. I mean, I, I, I'm quite excited about this new narrative. I could actually be the superhero in the tights that I always thought I wanted to be. So, um, but how do we get our narrative right quickly? And Andy, I'll come to you in, in a moment. But Steve, you know, that narrative to me is really, really important yet our institutions by default are probably not the most creative of um of sales mm. people yeah 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 look i i think it's a really um i think it's a really good challenge and, I, and we've been kind of trying to tackle this so we, so we have a um we've initiated a sector attraction strategy adam and i think this is this this, this for me is the critical piece i mentioned there um about competencies right and i believe that as you look across industries i mean for, here's a good example right so um we were looking at what we do for waste and recycling in industry and and i think it's fair to say that we're sat probably on the periphery of, of of what's going on in that and we we're here to support industry and it was part of our original um remit that was set out and the more that we kind of looked at the entire waste value chain as it, as it were and and where we could really add significant value and we identified straight away that that energy from waste element and how that then fits in with the likes of the national skills academy for power for instance is yeah. going to be an absolute critical part going forward specifically around that um things like um you know enabling technology like carbon capture and storage right so you know and and if you if you look well look who's focusing in on that who's really looking to address what those future uh kind of skills requirements are and, and you know we went off and we kind of dug into it and it's it's well you know um yes we've got bp leading on a um ccus element of um of what's going on in um you know in carbon capture but they're not looking at um the carbon capture and and it's it's almost like well the big it's seen as the big evolution is really about how we store this carbon and how we you know um, and how we deal with it but but the reality is on every power plant across the UK 
if it's fossils, if it's fossil fuels, if it's carbon intensive, it's going to need carbon capture to be part of that mix going forward. So therefore, we've, we've identified straight away that there are commonalities there. So straight away, that fits nicely into the National Skills Academy for Power remit. Now, my other element on this is that when you look at, uh, Katie, you probably pull out, and I've got a list of jobs up here, and I'm looking at, right, and they all fit in, well, not all of them, but I've got a top 20, right? And I could pull out probably, and probably half of them, which would fit into the waste management, kind of waste and recycling, uh, right? So they're, they're common stuff like, no one's got any CNI engineers, right? So, you know, it's electricians, mechanical engineers, you know, not they're not specific to any industry, but there is a shortage of them and we're all fishing in the same pond for the same people. So therefore, my challenge, I think, is, or our challenge is, um, is to attract people in to waste management, you know, power, water, gas, et cetera. And we need to keep them here. And we need to do so by making sure that the skills that they have are transferable as they possibly can. When we talk about us being a, you know, a cool and funky industry to work in, I think that's the challenge that we've got. But we can do that by saying that we are the industry for a greener world. So therefore, the the pitch that we're going in with is saying, look, you know, we're going to we're going to you're going to see a big campaign coming out of if you want to be part of the solution, you need to get involved with us. Yeah, we're the only we're, we're yeah we might be the biggest creators of carbon in some industries you know i talk about gas sector here you know etc but look we're transitioning to hydrogen we're capturing that carbon so we're doing all the things which are going to have which are going to be knocking off this you know the chunks of carbon in terms of what we um spit out as a country and we can really have an impact so if you want to be part of it get involved with us you know that's my that's my position hashtag part of the solution andy you had your hand up i think you you wanted to chip in briefly yeah yeah just just going back to your previous uh comment um uh, adam we, we see circular economy as a cross-cutting skill that should should go across all the other sectors um you know obviously circular economy resource efficiency etc and really help everyone reduce their scope three emissions that of course goes beyond just what the carbon dioxide they're emitting from their site. It's all about their products, their supply chains, and how they deal with the waste at uh, end of life. Um, just a comment on on Stephen. That might be a bit controversial, maybe, but oh, we want right. enough skills and qualifications in place to deplasticize the residual waste going to energy from waste. That's the solution we actually want: yeah. is to stop plastic waste going to energy from waste plants. One hundred percent agree. So, yeah. and, and 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 for those that are interested the esa is fully committed all of the waste companies operating in the uk are pushing on the same agenda right now we've got loads of questions coming in i can stop working so hard and just read them out so let's go for one green skills are they bankable because companies need to be incentivized not my words somebody else's words need to be incentivized or will need to see returns in order to make a change so katie now i'm going for quick fire answers you three now because i want to get through a load of questions so how do we either make green skills bankable or who should be incentivizing businesses? I'm not sure I want to answer that one. Oh, do I? What have you asked me for? Um, <laughs> to be honest, I think that uh, I think they are bankable. I think they're bankable in that you end up with a workforce that is engaged and retained. And, and that is a really expensive thing to replace every time, every time someone walks out the door. So I think, yeah, they are bankable. I think, um, I think there's an element of, you know, if, you, if you're not investing and planning for your future workforce, you're not going to be around. Uh, there's an element of it, it. It's not so much bankable as uh, mandatory. <laughs> I, don't, I can't I can't believe that people are still not, not doing this. I mean, there's an element of climate adaptation in there. All of these things are about business resilience it's, it's really about business resilience I think that's the bankability there in in investing in green skills having said all of that um, I also do think we need some government investment as well and we've called on government to set up a green skills fund uh, we've called on government to make changes around um, how the apprenticeship levy can be used so that it's more flexible for uh, particularly for sectors who don't attract young people um, and then struggle to backfill um, those roles so um, I think there's a there's there's a collaboration needed between government and industry here. Fair point. I'm I'm, I'm going to keep going with questions. I'm just going to pick on you as as we go. I, it's really interesting. I've got a couple of repair and reuse ones in a minute, but I'm 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 going to ask this one about engaging young people. Practical green skills. I'm going to I'm going to go Andy first because I, I I know he, he forages 
when when he's out running and he does litter picking as well. I'm sure he does. So how do we get practical green skills into schools with the under 16s so that they come out with a bunch of useful stuff, as well as knowing how to speak a foreign language or, you know, a history appreciation or, you know, in my case, a geography degree? Um, practical green skills, Andy. I mean, are we missing something in the, you know, in the curricula? Um, well, I'd say you, you might be in the rest of the UK um, or the rest of the world, um, but we've invested in eco schools um, for many decades. And I, I can't remember the number, but it's something like 80, 85, even 90 percent of our schools are eco skills. Um, we're also having conversations about the curriculum in Wales, um, where individual um, teachers and schools have now got a lot more freedom. So we want tools and resources to be provided. So maybe CRWM uh, can help out with that. And also, um, I haven't got kids, so hopefully I've got this right. The level two and level three qualifications, O and A levels in old money um, for uh, was that sixteen and eighteen year olds um, are you know there is scope there to develop circular economy qualifications. So I can't say any more, but we are having active conversations on that with uh, those who may be involved in developing those qualifications. So you're right, um, you know we need to start young. Uh, absolutely. And encourage new entrants for a career in the sector of economy and waste by getting them enthused at an early age. Absolutely. I, I, I am a STEM ambassador. I am a school governor. Um, I'm, I, I'm a, you know, a, a geography ambassador. I go into schools in, in my spare time, of which there's very little these days, by the way. But um, and I'm forever talking about the environment because I love what I do. And, you know, whether it's waste or it's sustainability or it's or it's just general environmental awareness, I, I think once you get hooked, why would you want a career or anything else? I mean, this is, this is you know, Andy and I, you know, we go around the block. We, we love what we do. So very passionate, but coming in, Stephen, what, how is it, you know, your types of sector? I mean, are they investing heavily in getting into schools to help them understand the types of, you know, hands-on skills and wider appreciation for, for the environment or the setting so that they, they can be a positive contributor, you know, once they become, you know, a, of an active age, let's say. Yeah, but there are, there are. But I, let me, can I, Adam, can I just go back? So I, th I think there's um, the question you asked about the, you know, what's the benefit of green jobs, et cetera. Well, I, 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 I challenge it slightly differently. And I'd say, well, if people don't transition to doing, thinking about green jobs, then I think we're going to miss a massive trick here. And therefore we won't be able to attract people to our industry because they'll just say, you know what, they're just doing the same thing, right? So we kind of need to, we all, we, we, God forbid I talk about greenwashing something, but we just definitely need to take a different stance on how we're trying to attract people in, you know, that kind of that engineer thing. Yes, engineer as a solution for what we need to do in the future to be able to make sure that we are um, addressing, you know, and achieving net zero. I think in terms of how we get that into schools is we're working with a, a number of agencies looking at curricula, looking at kind of what it means in, in all nations um, with regards to um, how do we fit in um, understanding what the energy system is, what the water system is, you know, what the kind of circular economy is, everything that looks at kind of what that transition to net zero can do and what the big net effects are of that. I think we need to be kind of working closely with those. And in fact, again, part of that sector attraction strategy is part of that. So how do we engage with schools? How do we engage with, you know, not but not just school leavers, not just schools, but also um, ex-offenders, um, ex-forces, you know, kind of neurodiversity as well. Um, looking at various elements of different um, roles and what different types of person would fit different types of roles. So therefore, trying to look at a much more diverse workforce, all those elements just give us more people with more skills, with kind of more varied, you know, a varied kind of background as well, I think, which just would never have looked at us as an industry. So I think the net effect is we're all the better for it. We're a richer society. We're a richer industry for having a much more diverse industry. Fair, fair passionate point. about it as well you are no <laughs> sorry sorry <laughs> right let's let's crack I, I was just gonna say my, my son started secondary school oh i need what six weeks ago and um he's already been doing like you know cooking um or whatever they call it now but it's cooking but hey i didn't get that when i was at school i was i'm the generation where that kind of stopped and he's he's into he's got needlework and they're doing sort of the art and design yeah. and actually there's a there's a really strong sustainability flavor running through ingredient choice or, you know, and, and, you know, what's in season and not in season and, you know, repairing your jeans or whatever it might be. So I, I'm kind of feeling a little bit more optimistic, but you know, he's only been there six weeks, right? Questions. Here we go. Um, 
Oh, big questions now. Right, quick one. Andy, do we need to train people on digitalization? Discuss. Uh, yes, uh, uh, absolutely. 100%. Um, quick, quick plug uh, for uh, Polytag and others who provide similar technology. Um, they are trialing the individual unique product um, labeling, digital labeling that could be used for a deposit return scheme uh, in future. Um, also, of course, some um, digital product passports. Uh, we're no longer a member of the EU, but I understand from reading up on what's going on um, that actually digital product passports will be mandated in a few years' time. Now, of course, um, you know other other nations uh, feed into the European Union in terms of their products. Um, so I think that's of interest to everybody across the globe in terms of supply chains into Europe. Thank you. Now, Sarah Downs has raised two really good questions. You've just answered one of them. Let's let's give her the other one because it's a, it's a corker. This is one that I'm always debating. Uh, do we need green jobs or do we need green embedded in all jobs? Hmm. And and I know, Katie, you and I were on a discussion with Desnes yesterday about embedding the skill set in a much broader church, if you like, than than our sector alone. So if that's the case, if, we, if we'd all nod, you all nodded, didn't you? Like, you know, and, and Andy's already talked about the circular economy is in all sectors. So therefore being sustainable should be in, in all jobs, in my opinion. Um, how do you make sure that's happening? Is it an operating license? Is it some kind of passport? Is it, a, you know, do you get some CPD points at the end of the year? How do you make sure it's happening and it's not just greenwash? Uh, Adam, I'll, I'll give you an example. When, when I worked in the environment agency uh, a few years ago, um, we, you know, we we had um, an environmental policy, and every one of us has an objective in our annual objectives to play a part in delivering that environmental policy. So it was embedded in our performance reviews. That's one way of doing it. And and I'll support that because at Suez, everybody has a a a, 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 a bonus target yeah. related to environment yeah. and well-being. Yeah. So yeah. I'm I'm a fan of embedding it. Um, if there's another answer. Um, Katie or, or Stephen, um, for that, uh, let me know. If not, I'll, I'll... I think KPIs are a great idea because they drive behaviour. Um, so embedding that within your business's KPIs is, is really important. But I would say that there's something that happens before that in terms of the curriculum and education itself and having um, elements of sustainability built into all of those core programmes that are ultimately churning out the workforce of tomorrow. Yeah, we need we need to influence people teaching design. We need to influence people exactly. teaching, you know, accountants yeah. um, that you can you can have a sustainability flavor and actually it's good for business and, and good for them personally. Right. I've got a good. Adam, got... Can I just Adam, can I just mention something? I, I think um, you're absolutely right. KPIs um, incentivizing people, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the organization just for, through market forces will become obsolete, will become irrelevant if they do not um, shape up. And, you know, I mean, you look at BP. Classic example, right? Other organisations are available. Um, they're no longer British Petroleum. They are BP. They, 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 they. Everything which they promote now is around that green agenda. So it's, you know, it's just organisations transitioning. Market forces will drive them down that route, I believe. Well, well made. Good point. Um, right. Question for Katie because it says CIWM Skills Report, which means it's either you or me, Katie, answering this one. Mentions change management roles, circular systems, behavioural change, transition planning, implementation, uh, as being central in this journey. Can you give us some examples or some detail of what these skills might look like? Um, you know, is it psychology? Is it you know admin skills? Is it you know user research? Is it something? What what, what do we mean by these you know kind of cat catch all titles? I mean, I think it's going to be, I think it's definitely going to be communications. It's going to be the ability to influence others and to win hearts and minds. That's a, that's a really important skill. And that's going to be, you know, part of the work is going to be outreach, outreach into householders, outreach into businesses, the ability to, um, to, to access and analyze data and report that back. I think it's really important. I think uh, Mark Shayla says what the waste management sector is a is a mirror and um, we're only a mirror if we can report that data back. So um, I think there's that data and analytics piece involved in there. There is change management in terms of actually what do the systems look like and how do the systems need to change? So there's, there's that systems piece. Um, leadership is going to be the, the critical part in all of this we're going to have to take a leadership role as a sector which means we're going to have to have some really strong leaders in businesses across our sector fabulous um i've got a more general question let's have a quick answer from the three of you start with andy is academia 
in touch sufficiently with industry and policy transition to be providing the types of graduate that we're going to need and not just in our countries but but globally andy quick answer please and then oh, you God. Uh, okay i spent 10 years in academia so i i uh, in the 80s so i i could rant on about this for a long time um some are and some aren't um th those who focus on research papers seem to only refer to other research papers and not people who are actually out there doing the job um which which i i find a bit ast astonishing really but that's down to academic journals and the way they write write papers um sadly i don't see many many academics in the conferences that you and i go to no. yeah um but i do know um certainly i i mean wales with our european funding our uh, academics did do a lot of work with businesses um and i know some of that is now continuing so um there are some very good pockets and good examples of that yes. happening but and I, yeah, they need to get out of their ivory towers a bit more, oh, perhaps. Ouch. There, there, there are there are some academics on the call who I are know, now busy, I busy know. writing in, which is excellent. I know, but I can give examples of research papers on waste strategies that don't actually refer to any waste strategy. No, I, I, <laughs> I, I, Andy and I go, go way back and I, I used to be a waste <laughs> academic. And, and, and there's nothing I like more than writing a published paper because it gave me yeah. bonus points. Absolutely. Like end of year <laughs> review. Um, but hey, I soon realized that being in industry was a much more fun and B, I actually got stuff done. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, where are we going? Uh, academia, Kate. How's CRWM getting on with with uh, waste and resource and circular economy type topics in academia? In in academia, um, so what we've what we've absolutely seen is a, um, a wholesale withdrawal over the last probably decade of the availability of um, sort of undergrad and postgrad courses in waste and resource management. Um, we, we have seen some of our topics embedded within other programs though, and I think um, you know you asked the question our academia on this and I think Andy's 100% right some are and some aren't but I've seen some really inspiring stuff you know if you talk to University of Cranfield um, they, they do a great program with their uh, design engineers who you know they bring businesses in they solve a, a sustainability problem together the business gets some fairly low cost research and development uh, the individuals get some hands-on practical experience not just that research ivory tower stuff and I think where we're seeing that happen we're getting we're getting people who come out inspired to be involved in a sector um and we're getting some real practical skills embedded within academia i think that's a really good point and actually i'm getting asked more frequently now to go in and do the practical workshop than i am to go and do the guest lecture or you know the afternoon mentoring or whatever it used to be so i, I may, maybe you're right the transition come. what about Stephen? you know your kind of sectors um, yeah. you've already said i mean academia plugged in supporting yeah, in, in some instances they are right? i mean in some instances they are but uh, in other areas they're not and and i think katie you, you you hit the nail on the head there some of the courses that have been withdrawn because there's they you know just doesn't seem to be that um, that interest but look i, I i'm going to be controversial here um and i'm going to say we um, we have a role to play in this because when we talk about our sectors, we need to be uh, bringing it up from the, you know, quite a lot of people think, well, you know, what's waste management? What is kind of water? You know, when you talk about clean water, et cetera, you talk about sewage, people have this perception that there is there are entry level roles associated with this. Right. Then, the, 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 well, surely, why would you need scientists? Why would you need, uh, you know, clinical academics? Why would you need clever people? working in these industries so we have a we have a, a um an image problem which we need to um we need to sort out and that is about making sure that people understand that digital skills uh you know which digital skills is massive and kind of don't get me started on that one um but uh the the, the academic level the, the kind of the management roles you know the project management associated with major infrastructure projects etc all the things which the exciting things which universities like to get engaged with that's what we need to be doing we need to be raising the profile of this to the point where it says yes you know there are really great job opportunities there are really great challenges for academics to come in and help us sort out um, within industry so therefore come and work a bit closer with us power are very good at it um i've got to say but um other areas i've not seen much um, much in in the way of academic support thank you i've got one final question you've all been brilliant i'm loving the chat by the way so if you're not watching the chat in the audience you should be because there's some brilliant chat um controversial chat too which is great um 
I, I, I've got a request. There's a university. They're online. University of Exeter doing some some wonderful circular economy masterclass work. Um, looking to embed that in uh, EMF and, and associated companies, which is great. But how do they scale it up? The, the question is, you know, we want to upskill senior level management to, you know, to, who are going to drive change in businesses like Suez, for example, I guess is their target. So my last question is going to go to each of you. Um, quick answer. What kinds of partnership do they need to be seeking out to make that kind of transition? How are they going to get the, the senior leaders, the C-suites of tomorrow to, to start embedding this stuff in their businesses? Um, or do they not need to? Because you've all told me that it's going to happen. Otherwise, your business dies. So maybe it's just an awareness issue. Stephen, you're up first. Um, I think it's 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 about um, turning the tables again. I think we're constantly managing upwards uh, within organisations. Therefore, actually, people step back and, as they say, sharpen their saw to be able to go back in again um, and and do a really good job. Just isn't there. I know you'll know yourself, Adam. That you are absolutely foot down, flat out all the time. So stepping back and having time to do an MBA um, or some kind of academic um, work that we're therefore will make you a better leader. Um, you know is. Um, you struggle with it sometimes. Fortunately, I did my MBA about 10 years ago before I got into a job, which didn't give me any time to do any study. But um, it's, you know, it's, it, yeah, that I, I think we need to um, perhaps, you know, the, the management of today need to lead by example, I suppose, and give people time to develop, time to evolve themselves and um, and do some good stuff to go for. Because otherwise, we, you, you just get the same thing, don't you? You know, you don't get managers, but you're improving as managers. So. I think it's, I think that's a fair challenge. Uh, Andy? Um, they need to work with uh, professional bodies, uh, of which there are several for management, um, trade, trade bodies, and also other parts of the jigsaw that I mentioned earlier. And a new one came to me the other day, a major recruiter of senior managers in some very large companies came to me and said, you know, but basically, you know, how, how can I help make some introductions for him? But he, but he was, he, you know, he leads on embedding circular economy skills within leadership, within the leaders they recruit. So don't forget recruitment agencies. There are a number around and they play a really important role. They also do training as well of senior leaders. They do, so, they do. you know, I, I did say to him, you know, work with others, across the board uh, to partner up and create those opportunities to get the, the right message out. Wise words, Andy. And since I put chief sustainability officer in my title on LinkedIn in January, I've been inundated by just these types of people wanting to talk to me. But they're important. You know, they're, they're, they're change. I was going to use the word change agent. You know, they, they are yeah. a change agent. One, I, I, one of several types. And and their connectivity is, is yeah. really impressive. So that's good advice. Uh, Katie, we've, we've got, some recruiters involved in our skills for the future working group. I think they bring a different perspective. What's your, what's your takeaway for, for the uh, university of Exeter who asked the question? I think there's, uh, I think for me, there's something around upskilling the decision makers in businesses around how they prepare for the, for the future. And um, Adam, we talk regularly about how do we get HR directors and um, HR leaders and senior leaders to understand what the skills needs of their people are going to be and how they're going to prepare for them. So I think there's probably almost like a lost leader in this in terms of do a very small a bit, maybe a bit of e-learning that could be delivered to your decision makers in businesses so that they understand why it's so critical for them to plan and prepare and, and just make time for this development. Fabulous. Thank you. Listen, you've all been awesome. Audience, you've been great. Hopefully we've answered your questions. I'm going to give my panel uh, literally a 10 second takeaway message. It has to be big enough to fit on my new t-shirt hashtag key message. <laughs> so I don't want any long winded. I don't want five minutes. We're running out of time. Andy, what's my hashtag? What am I taking okay, away? Uh, but, well, okay. Hashtag skills are key. Start as early as possible. Okay, that's cool. But I think somebody can get pithier. You know, we'll, we'll spin that later. Don't worry. I'll turn that into something that's got, got legs. Um, Stephen, I like it, Andy. It's a good message. Uh, uh, focus on competencies and not job roles. Yeah, I need a big T-shirt, but it's good. It's good. It's good messages. <laughs> Come on, Katie, deliver for me. What can, are I, we going can I have two on the T-shirt? Two, two, two. Yeah, two, two, front and back. Nice. Can I have a uh, hashtag keen on green? Okay. Oh, boom. And I'll, <laughs> and I'll have hashtag collab is key. Collab is key. Wow. I'm going to have to go get dictionary out. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Listen, um, audience, you were awesome. 
if you want to follow up with the audience, you know where they are. You can find them all on LinkedIn and hopefully you've been watching the chat. There's some really good stuff and I can see some linkages. Stephen's, he wants some people to get involved. You know, Andy knows everybody. Katie's got a working group that needs some help. And, you know, unfortunately you can all find me. I'm very easy to find. So thank you very much. Panelists, you've been awesome. Love your honesty um, and your passion. Um, it was there. It was obvious. Well done. Um, Sweater, it's been a pleasure as always. Thank you. Um, back to you. Thank you, Adam. Thanks to the uh, thanks to Andy, Katie, and Stephen as well. Just a reminder to our audience that we have another webinar next week on waste containerization with uh, Cole Rosengren from Waste Dive. So please, you will find details of it on our website. Please go and sign up. And uh, yeah, we will. I think this is the last webinar with Adam for this year. We will see you again in 2024 <laughs> with Adam. <laughs> bye bye. Have a good day. Take care. Thanks all. Thank bye -bye. you. Take care. Bye.